you're looking at me thinking, well, why in the world are we talking about this right now? Know that I'm not asking this question in a vacuum. But I think the idea of God asking us to do things in our life comes with quite a bit of price. We always talk about the, the sacrifices that we make for God and, and what those sacrifices mean to us. But rarely do we interact with the Bible story, in my opinion, that is so distinctly personal as the one that you read about in Genesis chapter 22, where God essentially asked Abraham, Abraham to do that exact same thing. And so as you sit there, and whether you look at your child or you think about your child, I want you to imagine real quick that that's what God has asked you, that God has asked you to take your child and give them up for adoption for a reason that you don't really understand yet. Let's read Genesis chapter 22. This is exactly what God asks Abraham to do here in verse 1. He says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. That's oftentimes the conversation between these two. He said, Take now your son, your only son whom you love. That's why I mentioned that earlier by accident. Take now your son, your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. And arguably one of the greatest single phrases of faith is verse 3. Abraham arose early. He just did it. So Abraham arose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering. And he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there. We will worship, and we will return back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took on his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father. He said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he has said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood, bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his son and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not only withheld your, or you not withheld your son, your only son from me. That Abraham raised his eyes, looked and behold behind him, a ram caught in the thicket by his home. And Abraham went and took the ram, offering him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham then, verse 14, called the name of that place. The Lord will provide as it is this day and the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. On the surface, and this is one of those stories in Scripture, and there's a lot of stories that people in the world will have issues with, but on the surface, this is an absolutely absurd story. It's one of those stories that a lot of atheists and agnostics look at and they gravitate towards because they say, I can't imagine that any God would ever ask this of anybody. Never mind the fact that later in the Old Testament you see the idea of infanticide, specifically ritualistic infanticide, where people offer their children and worship to a deity, is expressly condemned by God. And so it seems odd, at least in this passage, to put it mildly, that God would ask this of anybody. And other religions bear this out. If you look at, for instance, Islam, if you look at Hinduism, if you look at some versions of other, of, of other, of other religions, they have versions of this story, but they leave this part out. For instance, the Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the main central tenets of the Hindu religion, has Krishna asking this of one of his people, and the person just flat out refuses. I'm not going to do this. And so on the surface, this seems like one of those stories that almost just doesn't seem to make any sense at all. Why is it that God would ask him to do something like this? And the reason for it is very simple, although not any less alarming. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1, it says emphatically that the reason for this entire story is to test him. Which, by the way, according to verse 13 and 14, Abraham passes the test. And so at the, at the surface, at least a little bit more, it seems like it's even more sadistic. Because God is telling Abraham, as a test of his faith, to take a knife in his hand and sacrifice his son. What an absurd story. And it seems even more silly when you consider the fact that God has already tested Abraham. Go out of your land of Ur and go to a land where you don't know anybody, where you've never been. That's where I want you to go. That's what God told Abraham. You know what Abraham did? He did it. He got up and left everything he ever knew. And he left and went to a country that he didn't know anything about. He went there because God told him that would be enough of a test for most people. And then there are other people that would say, well, how is it that God is asking him to do this? Because after all, I thought James 1 said that God doesn't tempt anybody. And what we need to understand about that is there's a vast difference between the idea of tempting somebody and testing somebody. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1, starting in verse 3. You can put your finger or one of your tassels there in Genesis 22. We'll come back to it eventually. But if you look in James, the first chapter, 
James makes this, I would argue, this delineation very plain if you look at what he says here in this passage. In James chapter 1, starting in verse 3, and we'll jump around a little bit in this chapter, but I want to make this difference plain. James chapter 1 and verse 3. Actually, let's start in verse 2 because we have to get all of this context in. James chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing, not the tempting, but the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect results so that it may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Another synonym for testing could be proving, the proving of your faith. I want to see what rises to the surface. I want to find out the core of what it is. Verse 12, he talks about this, this, this delineation again here in verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. Once again, talking about much the same type of thing. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. There's that testing, the endurance, the cream rising to the crop, if you will, of our faith. Verse 13, there's the difference. Let no one then say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. God's not trying to get you to sin, lead you down the path of wickedness. On the contrary, verse 14, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when that lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. The reason he mentions there in James, the first chapter, and verse 15, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren, is because many people are deceived in this. They say, well, the reason that I'm going down this path is because God made me. God didn't make you. Each person is tempted when they're drawn away by their own lust and enticed. And then when that lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. That's the temptation. But the testing, the trial of your faith through perseverance, one thing that Peter would talk about is solidifies it and burns off all the impurities of gold, something that Christians naturally go through at the course of life. God isn't doing that to lead you down the path of wickedness. But through those moments, your faith is being tested. And being, it's being tested, it's being seen. But none of this really answers the question. If you look back at what Abraham's going through here in Genesis chapter 22, none of that really answers the question at all. Abraham's faith has been tested on a number of different occasions before that, some of which he's done really well, some of it he hasn't. And so on the surface, once again, this seems like an absolutely absurd story. And here's what I want to point out. This story on the surface makes zero sense unless you have the context of Hebrews chapter 11. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith. If you're in James, it's a few pages back probably. Hebrews chapter 11, starting verse 8. Listen to what God has to say about this event and some other events in Abraham's life. In verse 8... He says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for inheritance. He went out not this. Well, he's going to bring Isaac back to life. As soon as I sacrifice him, he's going to bring him back to life. That's the only logical conclusion. You know the only wrinkle in that plan? God had never done that before, at least in recorded scripture. I don't think of, I can't think of one passage up to Genesis chapter 22 where God had literally brought somebody back to life. He will, and we see that certainly in the Gospels, but he hadn't then. And so in Abraham's mind, the only way for God to be true to his promises was if God did the absolute impossible. That's why Abraham was willing to take his son and walk up Mount Moriah and sacrifice him because he thought to his core that this is what God would do. And when you frame it through those circumstances, when you think about everything that was going through Abraham's mind, it becomes less of a story about Isaac. And And don't get me wrong, Isaac is a huge player in this. Isaac willingly walked next to his dad for three days, not knowing where the sacrifice was. You thought that would have crossed through his mind. He also allowed himself to be tied up and laid on the altar. So he deserves quite a bit of credit for what he went through. But the story really here isn't necessarily about Abraham and Isaac. It's about the depth of Abraham's faith. And so that's why I asked you the question at the beginning of the sermon. If God asked you to take your son and give him up for adoption, what would your response back to that be? If God had promised you certain things, then certainly you would be looking forward to those promises, but you still would have to go through that process originally. Just as allegedly Abraham would have had to walk, and he was fully prepared to the point where he had the knife in his hand to walk all the way up the mountain, intending to sacrifice Isaac. So I ask you this question. I ask everybody this morning, especially dads, how deep is your faith? How deep is your faith this morning? And especially for dads as they think about the role as the leader of the house, as they think about the role as the provider, as they think about the role as the spiritual shepherd of their immediate family, how deep is your faith? Because I'll be honest with you, there are people here this morning that have had their faith, especially in that realm, 
tested to an extreme degree. Maybe not to the limits of Abraham, but you've had your faith tested. And so you may be sitting here thinking, well, my faith is super deep. That glacier doesn't even touch it. My faith is 10 times deeper than that. And that may be true. But I'll tell you that real faith is seen not just in these little moments that we have, but our faith is tested. Deep faith is tested over time. One of the things that we miss when we read the scriptures, and this isn't a fault of anything, but one of the things that we naturally miss when we read the stories in scripture is the scope and the scale of time that we're dealing with here. Even in regards to Abraham and Isaac, the amount of time that Abraham would have walked up towards or walked with Isaac up Mount Moriah, you're talking about three days. That is a long time to be alone with your thoughts as you're carrying up zero sacrifices up the mountain and your son is walking right next to you. When you think about the simple amount of time that Abraham had to sit and wait for Isaac to appear in the first place, from the moment that God made the announcement to Abraham that he would have a son to the moment Isaac showed up, we're talking about 20 plus years. And so when we talk about people's faith in Scripture, we lose the scale of time. And the fact that there were probably many moments that Abraham thought to himself, well, maybe God is true. Maybe he isn't true. Maybe I don't really understand what's going on. Maybe he lied to me. And faith is not proven in having faith today or tomorrow, but faith over years. James 5 mentions the faith and the perseverance of Job, the fact that he struggled with all the accusations for an entire week, and that's great. But what about Noah, who was a preacher of righteousness for a hundred years? And the only people that got on that boat was his family. We don't even know if they wanted to be there. It's all about perseverance. It's all about faith over time. Those are examples that we're looking at. Look in Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I love, at some point, we're going to go back through Deuteronomy. We studied it several years ago, and I was just a young kid then, and I'm much more experienced now, and I, I just see so many things in my wisdom now. Sarcasm is just dripping from the pulpit. It's probably on the front over here. But I love Deuteronomy because I love how many times, the more I read it, the more that it just seems so relevant. The fact that Moses is telling them all these things about what they're going to go through, and they're just like, yeah, check that off, check that off, check. Take some time and listen to it. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting in verse 1, Moses tells them all the commandments that I'm commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your forefathers. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, longer than I've been alive that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you, let you be hungry. And then he also fed you with manna, which you did not know. Nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. What God is telling them in this passage is, look, any group of people could have made the roughly, and this is exactly how long it would have taken, anybody could have made the three-month travel to Sinai, or to Canaan. Anybody could have done that. But when you think about how your faith has developed, it's not seen in these big moments with the crossing of the Red Sea and the big moments of taking out the Amorite. Those are the big moments. The moments where you see faith is when you realize at one point, hey, that clothing I left Egypt, that never went away. In all these years, did anyone ever have athlete's foot? No. Did anybody ever have a moment where they went really, really hungry to the Lord? Moment that, no. God provided for them every single step of the way. And I would argue, too, that depending on your age, you can look back at your life and think, well, my faith was solidified not in these big moments that I think about this amazing sermon that Brady preached, and it was just breathtaking. And I just, That wasn't where faith was. Faith was that moment when I was on my knees, and I prayed about this. And I was in the hospital, and I was here at this moment. It's the moment where I lost my job. It's that conversation I had with this guy. It's all these little moments that's proven over time. And what God tells us is, is deep faith is not created in a day. Deep faith isn't created in a year. Deep faith is created over time. It's one of the reasons why when you look in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, the Hebrew writer implores them to continue on. Hebrews chapter six, starting in verse nine, the Hebrew writer implores them, just keep moving forward have faith that God sees all of this. Hebrews chapter six, starting in verse nine. 
The Hebrew writer says, we are beloved, or beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not so unjust so as to forget your work and your love which you have shown towards his name and having ministered and still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. God sees you. God knows you and God recognizes you. One of the most beautiful psalms, in my opinion, you find in all 150 of them is where the psalmist says, put my tears in a bottle. Are they not in your book? God sees those tears. God sees your moments. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 9 through 12, what he's imploring them to do is recognize that God sees these moments of faith that maybe nobody else sees. God sees your work. When we begin to believe that God isn't paying attention, the Lord then allowed those nations to remain, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. That's an interesting note, wouldn't you say? That when God sent these people into Canaan, he gave them one directive, which was to go into all the nations that are around you within your inheritance area and drive them all out. Well, they obviously didn't do that. There were many people that waited years to do it. There are many nations who just never did it. And God certainly has the prerogative and the ability to go in and manually remove them. Pestilence, war, whatever. Could have done that. But he says, you know what I'm going to do instead? I'm going to leave these people here so that every generation needs to feel that struggle. Every generation needs to know what it feels like to lean back on me. And that's one of the uses cases of the judges. Not only that the judges delivered these people from their immediate predicaments, but also that they continued to learn to cry out towards God, that they looked back towards him. And I think that says something about our life. We look at the struggles in our life and we think, man, this is this guy again. Or look at a situation we think, I cannot believe this medical issue is still here. I've seen a billion doctors. My health care costs are through the roof. Or look at our job situation. We look at our family situation. We say, I cannot believe that I'm going through this. Or we take it distinctly spiritual. And we say, I cannot believe that I'm still struggling with this element of my faith. I've studied. I've read. I've disciplined myself. I've prayed about it. Why is it that I cannot figure this out? Maybe the reason is, is because that constant struggle you're going through reminds you of your need for God. When you look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11, that's arguably the reason he's making here when he says that no child or no father doesn't discipline his son. Every father should discipline their children. And the reason is, is because they need to correct them. They need to bring them back to him rather than the path that they're going on. But it's never done out of anger or hatred. It's always done out of love. Those struggles that you go through in your life remind you constantly of your need for God. That's an element of fatherhood that I don't like, and it's something that I'm just now going through now that my kids are in school. The idea that they come home and I pick them up from school and they tell me about some kid who put glue on their seat. I don't like that. I don't like the fact that kids are doing this to each other. But I also recognize that in those moments, I need to let them learn how to handle their own issues and walk with them through those issues rather than solving every little thing for them. Laziness always breeds arrogance. The fact that we just have whatever we want whenever we have it, it teaches us that we don't need to be reliant on God. But when your faith has been tested over and over and over again, there's a fire through that struggle that provides a deep faith. I would also argue that it's proven through vulnerability. One of the things that, once again, I love about Job, we've talked about him a lot this quarter because we're going through his book on Wednesday night. But one of the things I love about Job is his vulnerability. And I love the fact that Job is very much open about his life. If you read the stories in Job, Job constantly is handling accusations that are thrown against him. And in response to that, the only thing that he can do is say, look, I'm not guilty of this because this is, this is what I did. And if I've done this and done this and I've done this, then let those sins come to me. And at the beginning, it kind of speaks in broad generalities. But throughout the course of the book, he tends to get very, very narrow. He says, look, if I've done this and this and this and this, then let this come upon me. And in doing that, he's very vulnerable about his life. And that's the thing that we as guys especially don't do. We don't believe that strength is done through vulnerability. We believe that strength is is accomplished through grit and through fortitude and through ruggedness. When in reality, deep faith is proven by being vulnerable. Look at what the psalmist does when he talks to God. In Psalm 26, starting in verse 1, the psalmist is very open. Once I get to it, I'll read it to you. Psalm 26, 
Psalm 26, starting in verse 1. Imagine yourself praying this prayer towards God. David is nothing if not vulnerable. It's seen in all of his psalms. But in Psalm 26, starting verse 1, he says, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord, try me. Test my mind, test my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I don't go sit with deceitful men. Can you say that about yourself? Can I say that about myself? Nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders. I want you to ask yourself that question. Does this define me? Can I be that vulnerable with God? Because in the first three verses, he calls God as a witness to himself and says, Look, God, I want you to examine me. I want you to test me. I want you to try my heart. I want you to penetrate my soul as only you can and see if this isn't the case. That when I had a moment to be deceitful, that when I had a moment to be immoral, that when I had a moment to go where I shouldn't, I didn't. And if I did, as Job would say, if I did, then I'm extremely sorry for that. Psalm, David was saying in Psalm 51, verse 17, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, for this heart, on the assumption, the heart is worthless that I have right now. Create me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit, because the way that I'm operating now isn't working. Deep faith is proven through vulnerability because it takes a vulnerable person to say, I'm not as strong as I need to be, but I'm willing to get better. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, opens up his heart to the church of Corinth. And it's one of the things that makes his letters so relatable is the fact that he never holds his emotion in check. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 11. This is, this whole section right here, starting basically in the middle part of chapter 3 all the way to now, is extremely emotional. But he finishes this statement off in chapter 6 and verse 11 by saying, Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is opened wide. You're not restrained by us, but you are restrained by your own affections. Now, in a like exchange, I speak as to children, open wide to us also. The lack of vulnerability between humans is one of the biggest barriers that we have to overcome. Because we're so constantly putting up walls and charades and all these things about our life. And we say, well, this is who I am. And this is one of the fun I'm going to put onto the world. But being vulnerable allows us to say to God, I'm not as strong as I need to be. And it allows me to go up to the elders or to one of the other members here and say, well, look, I, I need help with this. I can't walk through this alone. And I need you to help me with this. The only person that's going to make a statement like that is the person who is vulnerable. Vulnerability breeds deep faith. You show me a Christian that is vulnerable with their fellow Christian, and I'll show you a Christian whose faith is being deepened by the moment. The original plan for this sermon, as we all do when you plan out a sermon, you think to yourself, well, this is logically the way that it's going to be. This is how it's always going to be. And logically, the way when I thought about this sermon, the way this was always going to be was I was going to begin with the idea of Abraham and Isaac, and I was going to end with Jesus. And obviously, it never ended like that. But I do want to make this one point as we think about this. It's often been said about God that he never asks us to do anything that he didn't himself do. And so all the things that we said about the story there in Genesis 22 about how Abraham offering Isaac is just absurd and it's unthinkable and it's offensive to us to even consider, that's the very thing that God did. And God didn't do it because we asked him to do it. 